Let me begin by saying, spiritual practice has many purposes. It has many functions. It has many abilities to change us. And I am a great example of that, as my practice has really stabilized me and made me a much better person than I used to be. But from the point of view of creation spirituality, spiritual practice is what takes us from fear to compassion. And that's what I want to talk about on this episode of Wisdom's Cry. He is the creator and sustainer of all the worlds, whether those worlds are known or unknown to mankind. unclouded by hate. Does not wisdom cry and understanding put forth her voice? And that voice is not mine. It's one that we listen to, that still small voice deep, deep inside. Hello, everyone. My name is Charlie. How are you doing today? So when we say that spiritual practice is what brings us from fear to compassion, this is extremely important. One of the things that you will hear me talk a lot about is uncertainty, doubt, and the great cloud of unknowing. God exists in a great darkness, and people don't want to accept that. And I understand why. You read any of John's writings, from the Gospel of John to the Epistles, and we get this plethora of language of God is light, God is light, God is light. Yet, In the Tanakh, we have repeated references to God pulling dark shadows around him, building clouds round about. It is the glory of God to hide a thing, and the glory of kings to find it, says the Proverbs. We, especially as people of faith, need to be very upfront with people and very clear Faith is not certainty. Those are very different things. Certainty is, well, I'm just going to be straight up with you all. From my point of view, certainty is demonic. It is diabolical to the core. And I mean that both in the like spiritual sense and in the etymological sense of it's something that divides and cuts into pieces. Certainty is a static nature. Certainty is idolatry. Certainty is what tells us that I know 100% for sure that my God is right and yours is wrong. So I can now just justify, oh, I don't know, a genocide, a terrorist attack, a (laughs) removal of other people's rights because I have decided through my own certainty that I am right and they are wrong. And thus, they don't need to be listened to. They don't need to be treated with respect. They don't need anything. Mm. Certainty is a vile thing. Now, I'm not saying that we can't have relative levels of certainty. Is the world round? Yes, the world is round. Does do. <laughs> you know, do have basic understandings of the age of the universe and how basic science works. Yes, but there's a difference there. That is all probabilistic knowledge. In other words, it's true so long as the math and the science works, but should corrections need to be made or updates happen, they are allowed to happen. That's how that sort of knowledge works. Ironclad certainty in those respects is just as harmful as it is with religion. But that doesn't mean you accept every crackpot idea that comes your way. No, no, no. But especially when we talk about religion, people want to be certain. 
and are easy, easily either hoodwinked or tricked by their own psyche into having a false sense of certainty. I know at various parts of my own life, I have fallen victim to this, where I would have told someone to their face, I know that I know that I know that I know. And while even now, I would still say that there are certain things that I truly know, that I believe that I know, I'm, I'm not in the same place where I would try to force those beliefs on others. And a lot of that comes from learning how we work as people. And please do not misunderstand what I'm saying, and please do not take it out of context. Listen carefully. We have no idea what the world actually looks like. We don't. I'm not saying that we don't have tools where we can measure temperature and distance and color and all of those things. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is the world that we experience is mitigated to us through our senses, through our worldview, through our understanding of how things work. You can see this a lot with language, especially languages that do not differentiate the color orange or the color blue or green. Those are often left out as well. Or that adopted those words later because they perceive certain colors differently. It's not that it's a different color. It's just a different meaning is assigned to it. What color is an egg yolk? Is it red? Is it orange? Or is it yellow? That's actually a cultural question more than it is a real question. It is a philosophical question. Where do you put the limits on those colors? And that's something that is culturally determined. That's kind of what faith is. That's kind of what religion is. It's our best attempt to reach out into the universe and see what's there. Yes, with the prophets, many of them experienced the universe reaching back. But all any of them could do, and all any of us can do, is mitigate that understanding of the outside world through our own worldview, through our own biases, through our own understandings of how the world works. St. Paul is a very good example of this. Paul constantly talks about the law of freedom, the law of liberty. Jesus came to set us free. Unless you're a slave, then be good to your master. Wait, what? Because in his worldview, he couldn't conceive of a world without slavery. He could not conceive of a world without kings and emperors and monarchs. Those were inconceivable ideas for him and thus ideas that he could not have. That's not an attack on St. Paul. That's just coming to grips with understanding how our minds work. When we first realize this, that we are trapped within certain preconceptions, that we are trapped within certain limits of what we can and cannot know for sure, fear is often the first response. Fear is often our go-to place. We freak out and start lashing out at the world around us. And in so doing, construct a certainty that we can hold on to and just accept blindly. When asked by an atheist friend of mine, do I believe Jesus literally rose from the dead? My answer was quite simple. I was not there. Have I had a spiritual encounter with the risen Christ? Yes, I have. And thus, I believe that Jesus was and died on the cross, was buried, and rose again from the dead. And I am confirmed in that belief because of my experience of the risen Christ. That's not going to convince her and that's not going to convince anyone else, and it shouldn't. But it convinces me. And that's all that it's there for. That's all that is necessary, is for us to have the experiences through our spiritual practice that show us that wider interconnected world that we live in. 
Yes, there are other things that we can use meditation for. Meditation can be extremely healing. Various rituals and practices can bring a great sense of healing and power and reinforcement. They can help save us from our grief. And they can welcome us into new phases of life and celebrate with us. There are many things that practice can do. But its most important and chief function is to move us from fear to compassion. Because fear is the enemy of all of us. It is the thing that causes us to be hateful, to be violent, and to be cruel. Fear corrupts the heart. So we have to get beyond it. We have to move past it. And we have to find a better way. And that's what practice is for. And why I try to talk more about practice than belief, even though I think for us to have a shared vocabulary, there are some terms of belief we do have to talk about. So before I get taken completely out of context, no, I am not saying that enlightenment is impossible. No, I am not saying that there is not a certain defkut that we can achieve, so a unity with God that we can achieve through practice. I'm not saying any of those things, because I believe all of those are possible. But, like I've been saying, the chief purpose of all of our practice is to teach us compassion. Because compassion is the healing balm that removes fear. Why? Because compassion does not require certainty. This is one of the great lessons we can learn from Cain. When Cain killed Abel and God questioned him about it, Cain's reaction was, well, am I my brother's keeper? And the common response to the law of Christ of, you know, to love our God with all of our heart, mind, and spirit, and to love our neighbor as ourselves is to say, well, who then is my neighbor? See, that's seeking certainty. That's seeking a way to change the narrative so that we can continue to have fear. You see, to love God with all of our heart, mind, and spirit is a lesson in compassion, because God is in all things, and all things are in God. Since that is the nature of things, if I am to love God with all my heart, mind, and spirit, I have to love everyone. And as Jesus said, the second is like the first, because it is, and that is to love your neighbor as yourself. So your neighbor is whoever's next to you. And you love them like you love yourself because God is in them and God is in you because God is in everything and everything is in God. That is the core message of Jesus Christ. And that removes fear. It really does. True love casts out fear, the apostle tells us. And it does, but it's not by magic. It's not like we wave our hands in the morning and go, fear be gone. No. The way true love casts out fear is that we look at the world around us and we understand, God is in me, I am in God. God is in me, I am in God. God is in me, I am in God. The kingdom of heaven is within. The kingdom of heaven is amongst us. The kingdom of heaven is within. We remember these things. Maybe, like I do sometimes, you recite them as mantras. Because that really does help. When you're having a really hard time with someone, God is in everything, everything's in God. God is in everything, everything's in God. God is in everything, everything's in God. <laughs> that helps. That is a spiritual practice. It helps to remind us of this core fact of our own interconnectedness. Oh, oh, Charlie, Charlie, it sounds like you're being a little uh, certain over there. Are you uh, violating your rule about certainty? No, because my spiritual practice has confirmed this for me. And you know what? I'm open to being wrong. I really don't think that I am, because every experience that I have shows the basic goodness, the basic joy, the basic humanity that I find in people. The interconnectedness, the intricate webs that tie us all together. Even if you try to argue to me that a specific 
description of God cannot exist for reasons X, Y, and Z, well, that's all right, because God is the ground of being. I, I can see that all around me. I have experience of that. So it's not so much a certainty as it is a lived experience. I'm open to argumentation, and I think a lot of the Christian concepts of God are wrong. I think a lot of the defined concepts of God are wrong, because they are, in their very nature, idolatrous. But I'm not saying that I am 100% right, it must be obeyed with 100% absolute devotion. I would never say that, because that is wrong, and that is a, that is a necessity of certainty. You see, if you are certain, then you are right. If you are right and somebody says you're wrong, they're threatening your certainty. If they threaten your certainty, they're liable to make you fear. That's a web. <laughs> that, that's a terrible cycle that destroys and grinds people down. I'm not afraid of being proven wrong, mainly because my experience has grown and developed and changed over my life. The words that I'm using now, I wouldn't have known to use 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. But as I've practiced, as I have experienced things, when I brought my first statue of the Black Madonna into the house, I wept when I saw her. I wept when I held her in my hands for the first time, because I felt this connectedness that I had never known before and my understanding of the world grew. That's what this is all about. Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. We are here to grow, to change, to mature, not to get stuck in our certainty. Our practices are not intended to tell us that we are right. They are intended to stretch us, sometimes to the point of breaking. I mean, have you ever done a proper meta practice, a, a pra proper practice of compassion? May I be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May I be filled with joy in the causes of joy. May those I love be filled, my, well, I'm sorry, may my family be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May my family be filled with joy in the causes of joy. May my friends be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May my friends be filled with joy and the causes of joy. May strangers, see, now it's getting harder. It's stretching us. It's easy to have compassion towards yourself and want to be free from suffering. It's easy for your family sometimes, depending on your family, and your friends. Now, strangers, people you don't know. May the stranger be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May the stranger be filled with joy and the causes of joy. Oh wait, but we're not done. May my enemies, those who wish to do me harm, be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May my enemies be filled with joy and the causes of joy. That's a stretch. And when you do this practice and you actually bring people to mind, you bring into your mind people that fit these descriptions. And you have to think of people that have hurt you. That's hard. But why do we want them to be free of the causes of suffering? Because we know that the causes of suffering build, they magnify, they are poisons in the world. And so even in that practice, we want even our enemies to be free from the causes of suffering, because then they will no longer be our enemies. We want our enemies to be filled with the causes of joy so that they will, again, no longer be our enemies. It stretches us. It challenges us. All of our practices challenge us. The journaling that I've been doing, where I sit and invoke the world, or God, or the angels, or a saint, and ask them to teach me, I am challenged by those things. And I'm rarely confirmed by them. 
Sometimes they say what I've always believed, and sometimes they're head scratchers that I have to think about. Do I take them literally? Do I take them seriously? I take them seriously, but I don't solemnize them. They're important texts that I hope to share with you because they've been very helpful for me. But I don't think that they are something that I need to develop a certainty in or that other people do either. Because fear requires certainty. Compassion requires faith. And that's what we're about. That's what we're here to do. That's the important task for us. So what do you believe in? What do you have faith in? What do you have compassion for? That is your path to God. Where is your fear? What are you afraid of? That is your path to the dark side, to the darkness, to hate and to certainty. I hope this helped. We're going through the six essentials of creation spirituality, and I, I'm, I'm hoping that this series is helpful for you. If you have any questions, comments, or topics you'd like to hear discussed on the show, down in the show notes, you'll find a link to the voice message system. Keep it short, keep it clean so I can use it on the show. I would love to hear from you. You can also find links to my social media and everything that I do over at wisdomscry.com. Thank you so much for listening. And I just, as always, I hope everyone is doing well. This was recorded during the coronavirus pandemic. I hope everyone is doing well. And as always, I would like to end with prayer. Most holy God, in the name of Jesus Christ, and with the intercession of Mary, our Holy Mother, and Francis, our Seraphic Father, we ask that you will guard and protect us, and that you will heal us, that you will give wisdom to our leaders and those who need wisdom, that you will give strength to the suffering and healing to the sick. We ask that you will guide us and guard us in all of our steps, that we may walk the path that your providence has laid out before us. And we ask, O oh Most Holy One, that you will give us the faith to take those first steps into practice, that we may find compassion and rid ourselves of fear. Perfect love casts out fear, we are told. And you, Most Holy One, are love. Amen. And amen.